Some of you may have heard about this. We have an election coming up in three days. Is anybody aware of that? Yeah, here's, here's what's awesome though. People care what I think. People are texting me. They're calling me on my cell phone. They just want to know my opinions about stuff. Uh, apparently, important people care what I think about issues. So I've got that going for me, which, which is nice. I, I'm sure you're getting those same phone calls and texts in this political season, and you're probably already sick of that. So some of you probably don't care that much about this upcoming election. You may not be planning to vote. Others you, of you are going to be really excited or really upset, depending on what happens in this election. And some of you probably are already up at night worrying about the future of our country. What's going to happen to me and my children? What's going to happen based on this election? And it worries you. And in fairness, the politicians and the media on whichever side you're listening to are telling you that this one election will decide the fate of our country. Our 250-year-old democracy that has been through civil wars, world wars, is going to be decided in November. And that's a lot of pressure, in fairness. Well, today we're kicking off a three-week sermon series called Kings and Kingdoms. And yes, we are talking about politics in church. I know some of you guys just panicked a little bit. Some of you guys were wishing you just stayed in bed this morning. Some of you are trying to figure out a way to maybe just slip out, roll down the, you know, see if you can get out of here without anybody noticing you leaving. Someone asked me this morning out in the lobby what we, I was preaching on today, and I said, politics. And it's like, I'd rather stay on finances from last, last three weeks. That tells you the level of excitement there is about this. And for some of you, religion or faith and politics don't go together. They just don't match up. It's all right to talk about faith. It's all right to talk about politics, but not together. It's kind of the way I think about Sean, our worship pastor, when he wears socks and sandals. I like sandals. I wear sandals. I like socks. I wear socks. I don't wear them at the same time. And when you do, it makes, a little, makes you a little uncomfortable for him and for me as well when I have to be around him. And I, and I think we feel the same way about politics, that we can talk about one, we can talk about the other, but maybe not at the same time. And I think this discomfort in talking about our faith and politics comes from really a misunderstanding of how our faith intersects with everything else in our life. And I think we kind of think about our lives as having all these different compartments. And, and you can think about this like a chest of drawers, that we have all of these separate drawers in our chest of drawers, and these are all individual areas of our life that kind of remain separate. And so we've got our finance drawer, and in that drawer goes our income tax returns. It's where our bills go. It's our debt, our savings. All of those different things go in that drawer. Then we've got a career drawer. And there's where our resume goes, our education goes, our hopes for raises and promotions in the future, all goes in that career drawer. And then we got a relationship drawer that kind of controls our family and those relationships, our friendships, and they all kind of go in that drawer. And then we got our politics drawer, and in that drawer goes who you're going to vote for, who you listen to, what news media you partake in, what pundits you listen to on podcasts, or who you read about, and all of that goes into that politics drawer. And then we've got our faith drawer. And, and in the faith drawer is a church attendance, prayer. Maybe we've got a little Bible study in there. Maybe we've got some mission work in that drawer. And we think about all of these drawers as being very separate. And look, when you come to church, you're good with me talking about the faith drawer. Preacher, go ahead and open that drawer up. Rummage around a little bit. Talk to us about that. Tell us how we need to improve in our prayer. Tell us how we need to come to church more often. That's your drawer. Pastor, we're okay maybe if you open up that relationship drawer just a little. You can tell us how we can look more like Jesus in our marriages and how we can look more like Jesus in our parenting, and that's okay. But some of you over the last few weeks got a little more uncomfortable when we opened up this finances drawer for three weeks. And I was actually really encouraged when a bunch of you have told me, I'm so glad that we did that financial series where we talked about spending and saving and giving. And I've heard a lot of people that are doing budgets for next year and people that are thinking differently about the way that they spend and they save and that they give. And so I was really encouraged about that, but we get a little uncomfortable when that drawer gets open. Then there's this politics drawer. I got to be careful about putting my hand in there because y'all might slam it shut on me because that just seems like it's an area that we shouldn't talk about. Nathan, why are you talking about that here? That's not for this 
place. Faith and politics don't mix. But see, that's actually not what Jesus teaches at all. In fact, he teaches just the opposite. He says that our faith is not one of these drawers. That our faith, our relationship with him, is the chest of drawers. And every single aspect of our life comes out of that faith. In other words, if we make Jesus Lord and Savior of our life, he's Lord of all the drawers. He gets to control all of those things. And so it's okay for us to talk about every aspect of your life here at church because there's nothing off limits for God. Your relationship with Jesus defines everything else about you. Well, if you have your Bibles, your Bible apps, go ahead and open those up to Daniel chapter 2. We're starting this series called Kings and Kingdoms, and today's sermon is talking about the politics of kingdoms. And we're talking about today how a Christian should view their earthly kingdom in light of the heavenly kingdom. In other words, what is the lens that we look at the United States through? And understand that United States is not unique in biblical perspective. These same truths we're talking about today would apply just as equally if you lived in England or Iraq or Japan or uh, Uganda. It doesn't matter. These are just different earthly kingdoms, different governments that play a role in our lives. And, And let me be clear. Before this sermon is over, I'm probably going to say some things that both sides like to hear and are going to irritate the other a little bit. So if you're a Democrat, you're going to hear some things, you're going to go, yeah, that's right. You're going to want to amen a little. And the Republicans may be a little uncomfortable. There may be some moments where Republicans are going to want to jump up and clap and cheer. I don't know if Republicans do that, but if they do, um, then they may jump up. And Democrats are going to be a little uncomfortable. But I want you to bear with me because we're going to look at this through a very biblical lens about how our kingdoms work together. Well, this book of Daniel was written by the prophet Daniel in the 6th century BC, so about 2,600 years ago. And this book is really a combination of a historical account of Israel's captivity in Babylon and also some prophecy about future events. Daniel would prophesy about some things that happened after Daniel's time, but before our time. And so we can kind of look, go back and look at that prophecy and did it come true. But he also talks about uh, some prophecy that hasn't happened yet. And we get to see that as well. But at its heart, this book of Daniel is really a survival manual. It is telling us as followers of the one true God, how do we survive? How do we thrive with a government that's ambivalent or maybe even hostile to our faith? How do we survive in a culture that doesn't hold our same values. And what's so crazy about this book of Daniel, what I love about it and why it just intrigues me, is Daniel is very precise and detailed about future events. And we can see some things that Daniel prophesied about that would come after his time and before ours that are crazy, crazy accurate. And then he also prophesies about Jesus' return. And so, in fact, his prophecy about things that happened in our past, but in his future, are so precise and detailed that a lot of secular historians say there's no way this was written in the 6th century B.C. Had to have been written in the 2nd century B.C. after all of these events occurred because nobody could be that detailed about these events. And this is because Daniel would accurately predict the fall of the Babylonian Empire He predicted the rise and fall of the Medo-Persian Empire, the rise and fall of the Greek Empire, and the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. And so you've got historians that go, there's just no way anybody could know that. In fact, one secular scholar said it this way, we need to assume this vision as a whole is a prophecy after the fact. Now, what you need to understand, they have no evidence that it was written later. It's just they look at this and they go, nobody but God could know those things. No man could know the details in that level of precision of what was going to come to pass. And as Christians, we go, yeah, that's kind of the point. That's what we're saying. Daniel never said that he had that ability. He said that there is a God in heaven who does have that ability. And so that's what we get to see here today. But in this, we also get to see how kingdoms relate to one another. All right, well, let's get started. This is Daniel 2, 1 through 6. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, Look, I've had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king, May the king live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will interpret it. 
The king replied to the astrologers, this is what I've firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I'm going to have you cut to pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you'll receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. So here's what goes down in the, in the, with the king. So these astrologers, they come in and the king says, look, I've had this dream and I need somebody to interpret it. And they're like, oh, king, man, that is right up our alley. We, are, we have the ability, we have connections with the gods, we are smart, we can interpret that dream. The king says, oh, whoa, 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 there's another part to this. You not have to interpret my dream, you also have to tell me what I, my dream was. And then they're like, whoa, that's different. You probably could have heard a pin drop. Look at how they respond in the next passage. The astrologers answered the king, there's no one on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among humans. So they're like, yeah, we got this. Oh, oh no. We, we, that, that's a problem, king. Nobody can do that. Only God can do that. And the king gets so mad at this point that he's going to have every single one of them killed and have their families killed, their houses torn down, and Daniel finds out about this, and Daniel says, hold on, give me just a minute. Let me talk to my God and see what my God has to say about this. And so Daniel, along with his buddies, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they pray, and God actually gives Daniel a revelation of what this dream is and what the interpretation is. So Daniel goes back to the king, and look what he says when he goes back to the king. No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he is asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals the mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the days to come. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you were lying in bed are these. So he sets this up and he says, look, I can't do it. Nobody can. But there is a God in heaven who can. And then he's going to tell Nebuchadnezzar what his dream was. Look at the next part. Here's the dream. Verse 31. Your majesty looked and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. <clears throat> then the iron, the, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were broken to pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. So he says, here's your dream. And the king's pretty impressed because he just told him what his dream was. But, but then he starts to interpret that dream for Nebuchadnezzar. And look what Daniel says, starting in verse 37. He says, your majesty, you're the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands, he has placed all mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds in the sky. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them. You are the head of gold. So he tells Nebuchadnezzar something that Nebuchadnezzar likes hearing. He says, Nebuchadnezzar, I mean, you are a great king. Right now, you rule the earth. Everybody is beholden to you. Everybody answers to you. So you are represented by the head of gold on that statue. And that makes a whole lot of sense because Babylon, Babylon was known for putting gold over things or plating things in gold. But in that same breath, Daniel says, there's a God who's above you that gave you the authority that you have and has the right to one day take that away from you. And then Daniel's going to keep going about that, and it's going to probably get a little less comfortable for Nebuchadnezzar. Look at verse 39. After you, in other words, one day you're going to fall, another kingdom will arise inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. So he says, King, you're a great king. You have an amazing empire. But, but it's not going to last forever. It's not eternal. And sure enough, 65 years later, the Babylonian Empire was conquered by the Medo-Persian Empire, and somebody called Cyrus the Great would take over. And so we get to see that come about. And I'm sure in this moment, King Nebuchadnezzar is not real thrilled with what he saw. And, and so Daniel says, look, the Medo-Persian Empire, that's, that's the chest and arms of silver. They're not as valuable as gold. It's, not, it's inferior to your kingdom. Why, why does he say that? Because what we know is during the Medo-Persian rule that there was less stability in the world, there was less human flourishing and progress being made that was made in the Babylonian Empire. So it was inferior. Then in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, 
that kingdom falls and a third kingdom would rise to power and it says rule over the whole earth. Well, who is that? That's the kingdom of bronze. That's Greece. That's Alexander the Great. You guys have all heard of Alexander the Great. Great. He conquered the entire world about 270 years after this. In fact, it's said about Alexander the Great that at one point he literally wept because there were no more kingdoms left for him to conquer in the world. And if you're thinking, well, okay, Nathan, I don't see names. I kind of see bronze and gold. I don't see enough detail. Maybe, maybe you're just reading some things into it. Let's look a little later in this same book. Let's look back at Daniel 8, 20 through 22. This is a different vision that Daniel is given. And it's about animals, not about a statue. But look at the detail. Verse 20. The two-horned ram that you saw represents the kings of Media and Persia. Well, there's the media, kings of Media and Persia that are going to take over. The shaggy goat is the king of Greece, and the large horn between its eyes is the first king. The four horns that replaced the one that was broken off represent four kingdoms that will emerge from his nation that will not have the same power. How's that for being pretty specific about things that would happen 250 years later? He says the Medo-Persian Empire is going to take over, and then the king of Greece, this guy's going to conquer the whole world, but then when he dies, his kingdom is going to be split into pieces. We know that's exactly what happened with Alexander the Great. You can see why secular historians start to go, this, this, can't be, this can't have been written back in the 6th century B.C. All right, and then look at verse 40 back in chapter 2 where we are. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. What empire is he talking about there? Roman Empire. Man, they are the, the empire of iron. It talks about how the Roman legions would crush the world before them. How they would rule with an iron fist. And that's the way it's described in history from B.C. 146 all the way to 476 A.D. And that's just the Western Kingdom. The Eastern Roman Empire lasted even longer than that. But then look at verses 44 through 45 where Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar about another kingdom that's going to come to pass. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to other people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them and put them to an end, but itself will endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. This dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. So he said, look, there, there's going to be another kingdom that God will set up himself. And this one's never going to pass away. It is going to be superior to all the other kingdoms, and it's never going to be replaced. Now, we obviously know this is talking about the, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God that Jesus will establish. But theologians kind of, I guess, debate whether verses 44 and 45 are talking about Jesus' first coming 2,000 years ago when he was born in Bethlehem, or it's talking about his second return when he comes back at the end of time. And so you may be asking me, which is it? Yes, <laughs> it's both. Because we see here that during the Roman Empire, Jesus is going to be born, and he's the rock that it's talking about. Jesus would call himself the cornerstone. He was the rock on which this new kingdom was built. And think about that. A rock is generally not thought of as nearly as precious as these other metals in this uh, dream, the gold, the silver, the bronze, and the iron. But the rock would ultimately be what brings all of those things down. And that's how Jesus referred to himself. So it's talking about Jesus 2,000 years ago. But it's also talking about Jesus when he returns because Jesus is also the rock that will turn into the great mountain that will fill the whole earth. That's when this kingdom will be complete in that second coming. Now, if you're thinking, well, okay, but it's not being real specific here about who does what, how this happens, maybe it's just not specific enough. Well, let's look, just like we did for earthly kingdoms, let's look a little later in Daniel and see where Daniel gets a little more specific about this kingdom of heaven. This is uh, chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So we can see a pretty clear description. He says this one, one that looks like the Son of Man. What Jesus often, what Jesus mostly call himself, Son of Man. 
will come in the clouds. And then we see this distinction between the Ancient of Days, or God the Father, and Jesus. This is the Old Testament, keep in mind. And we see this picture of Jesus' second return. And I think when we see this kind of prophecy about things that have already happened for us, and we see the precision and accuracy of that. But then we also see prophecy about what will happen one day for us. We ought to be moved by that. We ought to be changed by that. That ought to impact us. We ought to leave a little different knowing how much in control our God is that he gives us that kind of picture of what the future looks like. And we know this prophecy impacted King Nebuchadnezzar. Look at what happens here in verses 46 through 47. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Suddenly, Nebuchadnezzar's perspective on the kingdom of heaven and his own earthly kingdom changed a little bit because he thought his earthly kingdom, he thought that was the end-all, be-all of everything. It was what would conquer the world. It was what everybody was under the control of. And suddenly he realizes that there is a bigger kingdom than his. That his power, even though great, is derivative of a greater king. That there is a Lord of lords and king of kings who has power and who's given him a little of that to reign for a little while. And see, that's also the proper perspective for us to look at politics, for us to look at this earthly kingdom and the kingdom of heaven. Look, I love this country. I love America. I stand up, I say the Pledge of Allegiance, I put my hand over my heart. When the national anthem plays, hand over heart, I sing, I proudly sing. I love Zach Brown, Chicken Fried. I love that song. I sing it, I play it all the time. I love America, but it is not first in my heart. And for a Christian, it cannot be. We have to understand what is most important. See, this presidential election in three weeks, it's a big deal. It's going to have an impact on our life. Depending on who wins, it's going to impact us in different ways. But we need to keep that in perspective. There's a king bigger than that. There's a kingdom bigger than that. And if we can put our hope and our faith and our trust in the right kingdom, then you're not going to be up all night after the election and then at 5 a.m. realize you're still weeks away from knowing who won anyway. We've all been there. But if you can have your hope in the right place, that won't happen. As a follower of Jesus, your primary hope isn't in the government of the United States. The problems in this world are never going to be solved by Congress. The kingdom of heaven will not arrive on Air Force One. Our hope isn't in political rhetoric or political reform. Our hope is in the word of God. That doesn't mean that political reform isn't good. It's a good thing, but it's not where our hope is. Our hope isn't who sits in the Oval Office. Our hope is ultimately who sits on the throne. So what does it look like? What does it look like for us to put the kingdom of heaven first, to prioritize that over the kingdom of America? It means that our relationship with Jesus defines every single aspect of our lives. He controls all the drawers. Your faith in God should affect and modify every single thing about you, including your politics. All right, I'm going to excite English teachers for just a minute. Your faith, being a Christian, shouldn't be thought of as a noun. It should be thought of as an adjective that modifies all the nouns in your life. Let me explain what I mean by that. If your job is a teacher, you're a Christian teacher. And being a Christian modifies how you teach, how you think about that job. If you're a father or a mother, you're a Christian father or a Christian mother. And being a Christian impacts and changes the way you parent. In the same way... You are not a Democratic Christian or a Republican Christian because in that situation, your politics define and change your Christianity. Instead, you're a Christian Democrat or a Christian Republican because your Christianity, your faith, affects and modifies your politics. Our faith controls all the different drawers, including our political drawer. And so I want to wrap up with a few examples of what it looks like to allow your faith in God to modify your politics rather than allowing your politics to modify your faith in in God. All right, here's the first thing that happens if we put and prioritize the kingdom of heaven. If the kingdom of heaven is first, you won't turn politicians into saviors. So let me tell you about Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, before this moment, 
Thought he was the savior. The whole world answered to him. He controlled the peace. He could decide who lived and died. He was ultimately in charge. He was the savior of the people. After that, his perspective changed a little bit. And it should for us too. And if you think we don't still turn politicians into saviors, listen to some of the language that you'll hear Christians say. Even some preachers say about certain politicians. They'll say they're chosen. That's not political message. That's a messianic message about Jesus. Jesus is chosen. Or or they'll say things like, this election is a battle between good and evil. Or this person was called to restore America. They're not called to restore America. Jesus is called to restore all of creation. That's messianic language about Jesus, not language we use for a president or a politician. Here's another way we can turn politicians into saviors. If you are more comfortable evangelizing people about your faith in a particular politician than you are your faith in Jesus, that's a problem. If you don't have any problem posting all over social media, standing around the water cooler, talking to your friends and neighbors about your political savior, but you have a problem talking about your eternal savior, (laughs) you got your kingdoms messed up. You got your priorities out of whack in that circumstance. Something's not right. All right, here's the second thing that happens when you have your kingdoms in the right order. If the kingdom of heaven is first, you'll participate in love. That means you'll participate in politics in love. I read an an article about a Barna survey that said that 32 million self-identified Christians that say they go to church regularly don't plan to vote in this election. I was floored by that. That it said that there were lots of different reasons for this, that some of them felt like they can't decide, you know, they don't like either candidate. Some of them said that they're just done with the political process. Some said it just doesn't really matter. I can't make a difference anyway, so why am I taking the time and the effort? Let me start with this. 32 million votes <laughs> will make a difference. The last presidential election was decided, total popular votes, 7 million, which is way less than 32. But what we also know is when you get right down to it because of the electoral college, it was much closer than even that. 32 million votes will make a difference. It's important. But let me be clear. Politics isn't unique. Nothing unique about it. It's just one of the drawers that our faith controls. But we are called by Jesus to be a light in every single aspect of our lives, every single one of these drawers. And I think we have a tendency with politics to wait for politics to save us. We're waiting for a light at the end of the tunnel. And Jesus is saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're not waiting on a light. You are the light. Be the light. Be the light in these different drawers, including this politics drawer that can be very dark and ugly if we're not involved in it. We're also commanded to be salt, the salt of the earth. Jesus says both of these things in Matthew 5, 13 through 16. He says, you're light, you're salt. Light brightens the world. It brings Brightness to dark places. Salt preserves, restores, makes things more flavorful and makes them better. Voting isn't an exception to this command to be salt and light. It's not unique, it's not special, but it is one of the places that we are called to be salt and light. We're called to be salt and light in our finances, our career, in our families, and yes, even in our politics. So here's my challenge to you. Let love be your platform. Think about that just for a second. What would it look like as Christians if we let love be our platform? So before you talk about politics with somebody, think about, am I being driven by love? What's driving this? Before you post on social media about a politician or politics, think about, am I being driven by love? What's motivating this? Because the reality is this, the moment that my political opinions or my political involvement comes from something other than love and humility, I betrayed the first kingdom because the first kingdom is all about love. See, we live in a time where biblical issues have been misappropriated by politicians. They they take these issues that have been around for thousands of years that are biblical, and they make them feel political. And then they make us uncomfortable when we talk about it in church because they've appropriated it and made it sound political. And and some of these issues, we'd say, "Whoa, whoa, wait a second. In love, we tell you that 2,000 years before this was a political issue, This was a biblical issue. These go all the way back, some of them all the way back to the book of Genesis at the very beginning of the Bible. And we respond in love. Our voting decision has to be made in love, like every other decision we make. 
We need to vote to help the least of these, to defend the sanctity of life, to protect the unborn, to protect the most vulnerable people in our community, to make sure that right and justice are taking place as best we can do it, and to make God's priorities priorities here, to make God's truth available here, even when it's a little uncomfortable to talk about, even things like the sanctity of marriage. Let me be clear, though. Neither political party lines up right up with our Christian faith. They don't. And I assure you, neither one of these presidential candidates are anything close to perfect or a savior. But you need to pray about how do I bring the kingdom of heaven to earth? How do I make this country better for people to allow God's truth to be shared in freedom and love? Most of you guys, you know the Lord's Prayer. What do you say in the Lord's Prayer? One of the things you say is, your kingdom come, your will be done. What are we praying for when we say that? We're saying that God's priorities and his passions wouldn't just control heaven, but they would come down and control earth too. We're asking for the kingdom of heaven to take the place of the kingdom of earth and to control and dominate that. And the reality is we shouldn't just pray for that. To the extent that we have the ability, we need to help make that happen. One of the ways we can do that is vote. And then we turn that over to God because that's what we can do in that situation. We can help bring about God's priorities, his passions, his loves into the earthly kingdom. See, we need Christians involved in politics and holding offices in government. We should pray for that. We should vote for that. Our platform is love. Here's the third way that you can make your kingdom, uh, get your kingdoms kind of in the right order. If your kingdom, if the kingdom of heaven is first, it will be your top priority. You know, occasionally I'll be asked by somebody, why don't y'all preach more on political issues? You know, there are, there are other preachers here in Katy and there are preachers in Houston that they'll even talk about local political issues, crime and infrastructure and those kind of things. Why don't you preach on that? And I'll say, generally I'll say, look, here's what we preach on. We preach on who Jesus is, how we respond to that, and what the Bible has to say. And, and that's really our focus. And I've been very comfortable with that position. But I have to admit, it it really got challenged recently because I read a blog article by a pastor that's retired now that I put a lot of trust in, a lot of faith in, who I think is an amazing pastor. And I read his blog article to see how I can preach better and how I can be a better pastor. I've listened to dozens, hundreds of his sermons over the years. And he wrote a blog article that, that said, look, given where our country is right now and how far our country has fallen away from being a nation under God, you need to preach on politics. You need to be pretty specific about the issues and maybe even who to vote for on how to make sure that we stay a Christian nation. Well, that stunned me a little. I mean, that's somebody that, I mean, I do, I value their opinion and it made me second guess and and reevaluate what I think about that. And and so I went back and I I looked at, how did Jesus look at this issue? How did he deal with this issue? How, How did the apostles deal with politics and politicians? And you know, after I reevaluated and I went back and looked at all of this, I, I'm right back where I was before. Because I believe this. We are going to be a church who talks about biblical issues, even if they've been made political, even if they feel uncomfortable. We're going to be that church. But we're not going to talk about who to vote for. We're not going to talk about political issues that aren't biblical because that's not what Jesus did. It's not what the apostles did. I look at what Jesus did. Think about it. Jesus rarely talked about politics, almost never mentioned it. And yet, it's a little surprising if you think about it because the Roman Empire had conquered Israel. They were a dominated nation. There was slavery. There was injustice. There were all of these different problems. There was wild violence and miscarriages of justice. And yet, Jesus really doesn't talk very much at all about this. They wanted Jesus to start a revolution and overthrow the Roman government. That's not what he did. And, you know, then I think about Paul. You know, I'm sure when Paul wrote the book of Romans, there's probably a lot of pressure on Paul to talk about Roman politics because he's writing to the church in the city of Rome. And by the time he writes this letter, there were already injustices starting against Christians. There was some limited persecution already happening. There was disparate treatment of Christians, and they were affected in their jobs and different things. And when Paul writes this letter, I'm sure people, it's a long letter, and I'm sure the church in Rome is waiting. Where is he going to call out the Roman government? Going through and going through And it never happens. And I wonder if they weren't a little disappointed with Paul. Paul, this is not the time for weak-kneed preachers. Get out there and challenge the Roman government. But that's not what he does. And you've got to ask yourself, was it because Paul was afraid? 
Was he, was he scared? Well, this is the Paul that was shipwrecked at least three times, bitten by snakes, beaten with rods, beaten with whips, stoned, left for dead, run out of town, ridiculed, mocked. Ultimately, he was killed by the Roman Empire, beheaded for preaching and teaching about Jesus. Is Paul really scared of a tough sermon? And then I think about the Apostle Peter. He wrote two books of the New Testament that were letters called first, we call first and second Peter. And both of those letters were written after the book of Romans was written by the Apostle Paul. And by this point that he wrote those letters, Nero was in control of Rome and persecution had gone from problematic to horrible. Christians were being impaled on stakes. They were being fed to live animals. They were being lit on fire to be party favors, just to be lamps hanging out while people drank and ate. But you know who Peter never mentions in either of his letters by name? Nero. He also didn't talk much about politics. And you, you got to wonder, was that because Peter was, was that because he was afraid? Well, this is the Peter that was crucified for preaching and teaching about Jesus. You know, when they were going to put him on a cross, he didn't beg for his life. All he did was say, can we turn that cross upside down? Because I don't deserve to die the way that Jesus did. Was he afraid to talk about politics in that moment? They weren't afraid. They didn't talk about politics because they were focused on higher truths. They were living and dying for a kingdom that's greater than any of these kingdoms of earth. The more I've thought about it and prayed about it, the more I realize that it takes great courage to remain focused on biblical truths when the fear inside of us makes us wanna say we can fix things with politics. It takes courage to boldly preach the unchanging truth of Jesus, even when it's uncomfortable, even when it's been ch challenged by politics, but to stand strong and not get caught up in earthly kingdoms. We preach on the kingdom of God over the kingdom of America because it's the kingdom that matters. It's the kingdom that will ultimately stand. It's a priority for us as individuals, and it's a priority for us as Christians. Karis City is going to be a church that stands on the platform of love, that tries to live in the difficult teaching of grace and truth, always trying to find that balance of what it looks like, that love people and accepts them right where they are, no matter what they did last night, no matter what their political opinions are, how they're going to vote in a couple of weeks. If you want to know what the political position is of this church, let me show it to you. This is for 2024, 2028. You go as far out as you want to. This is the political position of Kara City Church. Paul says it in 2 Corinthians 4.18. He says, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. That's our kingdom. That's where we focus on that kingdom that we can't see yet, but we know it's coming and we know it's eternal. We will allow the kingdom of God to affect every single aspect of our life, including our politics. Let's pray.